With Dietz dead, Augustus and Call alternated the scouting duties. One day, Augustus asked Newt to ride along with him, much to Newt's surprise. In the morning, they saw a grizzly, but the bear was far upwind and didn't scent them. It was a beautiful day, no clouds in the sky. Augustus rode with his big rifle propped across the saddle. He was in the highest of spirits. They rode ahead of the herd some fifteen miles or more, and yet when they stopped to look back they could still see the cattle, tiny black dots in the middle of the plain, with the southern horizon still far behind them. I never thought to see so far, Newt said. Ain't it something, Augustus said with a grin. This is rare country, this Montana. We're a lucky bunch. There ain't nothing better than this, though you don't have to tell your pa I said it. Newt had decided it must be one of Mr. Gus's many jokes, making out that the captain was his pa. I like to keep Woodrow feeling that he's caused a peck of trouble, Augustus said. I don't want him to get sassy. But I wouldn't have missed coming up here. I can't think of nothing better than riding a fine horse into a new country. It's exactly what I was meant for. And Woodrow, too. Do you think we'll see Indians? Newt asked. You bet, Augustus said. We might all get killed this afternoon, for all I know. That's the wild for you. It's got its dangers, which is part of the beauty. Of course, the Indians have had this land forever. To them, it's precious because it's old. To us, it's exciting because it's new. Newt noticed that Mr. Gus had a keen look in his eye. His white hair was long, almost to his shoulders. There seemed to be no one who could enjoy himself like Mr. Gus. Now there's women, of course, Augustus said. I do cotton to them, but I ain't found the one yet who could hold me back from a chance like this. Women are persistent creatures and will try to nail you down. But if you just dance on off, you'll usually find them close to the spot where you left them, most of them. Do you really know who my pa is? Newt asked. Mr. Gus was being so friendly he felt he could ask. Oh, Woodrow Call is your pa, son, Augustus said, as if it were a matter of casual knowledge. For the first time, Newt felt it might be true, although extremely puzzling. Well, he never mentioned it, he pointed out. Just being told such news didn't settle much. In fact, it just made new problems. For if the captain was his father, then why hadn't he mentioned it? It's a subtle problem, Augustus said. Newt didn't find that a helpful answer, mainly because he didn't know what subtle meant. Looks like he'd mention it, he said softly. He didn't want to criticize the captain, especially not to Mr. Gus, the only man who did criticize the captain. It wouldn't be his way to mention it, Augustus said. Woodrow don't mention nothing he can keep from mentioning. You couldn't call him a mentioner. Newt found it very puzzling. If the captain was his father, then he must have known his mother. But he had never mentioned that either. He could remember times when he had daydreamed that the captain was his father and would take him on long trips. Now, in a way, the daydream had come true. The captain had taken him on a long trip. But instead of feeling proud and happy, he felt let down and confused. If it was true, why had everybody been such a long time mentioning it? Dietz had never mentioned it. P.I. had never mentioned it. Worst of all, his mother had never mentioned it. He had been young when she died, but not too young to remember something so important. He could still remember some of the songs she had sung to him. He could have remembered who his father was. It didn't make sense. And he rode beside Mr. Gus for several miles, puzzling about it silently. Did you ask me along just to tell me? Newt asked finally. Yep, Augustus admitted. Newt knew he ought to thank him, but he didn't feel in the mood to thank anybody. The information just seemed to make his whole life more puzzling. It spoiled every good thing he had felt for most of his life, not only about his mother, but about the captain and about the Hat Creek outfit as a whole. I know it's tardy news, Augustus said. Since Woodrow ain't a mentioner, I thought I'd tell you. You never know what might happen. I wish I'd known sooner, Newt said. It was the one thing he was sure of. Yes, I expect you do, Augustus said. 
I ought to have discussed it sooner, but it was really Woodrow's place to tell you, and I kept hoping he'd do it, though I knew he wouldn't. Is it that he don't like me? Newt asked. He felt a longing to be back in Texas. The news coming when it did had spoiled Montana. No, Augusta said. What you have to understand is that Woodrow Call is a peculiar man. He likes to think that things are a certain way. He likes to think everybody does their duty, especially him. He likes to think people live for duty. I don't know what started him thinking that way. He ain't dumb. He knows perfectly well people don't live for duty. But he won't admit it about anybody if he can help it. And he especially won't admit it about himself. Newt saw that Mr. Gus was laboring to explain it to him, but it was no good. So far as he could tell, the captain did live for duty. What did that have to do with the captain being his father? Woodrow don't like to admit that he's like the rest of us, Augustus said, seeing the boy's perplexity. He ain't, Newt said. That was obvious. The captain never behaved like other people. He ain't, that's true, Augustus said. But he had a chance to be once. He turned his back on it, and now he ain't about to admit that he made the wrong choice. He'd as soon kill himself. He's got to keep trying to be the way he thinks he is. And he's got to make out that he was always that way. It's why he ain't owned up to being your pa. Soon they turned and headed back toward the herd. It's funny, Augustus said. I knew my pa. He was a gentleman. He didn't do much but raise horses and hounds and drink whiskey. He never hit me a lick in my life, nor even raised his voice to me. He drank whiskey every night and disappointed my mother, but both my sisters doted on him like he was the only man. In fact, one of them's an old maid to this day because she doted on Dad. But he never interested me, Dad, he went on. I lit out from that place when I was 13 years old, and I ain't stopped yet. I didn't care one way or the other for Dad. I just seen that horses and hounds would get boring if you tried to make them a life. I spect I'd have wrecked every marriage in the county if I'd stayed in Tennessee, or else have got killed in a duel. Newt knew Mr. Gus was trying to be kind, but he wasn't listening. Much of his life he had wondered who his father was and where he might be. He felt it would be a relief to know, but now he knew and it wasn't a relief. There was something in it that thrilled him. He was Captain Call's son, but more that felt sad. He was glad when Mr. Gus put the horses in a lope. He didn't have to think as much. They loped along over the grassy plains toward the cattle in the far distance. The cattle looked as tiny as ants. Chapter 94 The men began to talk of the Yellowstone River as if it were the place where the world ended, or at least the place where the drive would end. In their thinking, it had taken on a magical quality, partly because no one really knew anything about it. Jasper Fant had somehow picked up the rumor that the Yellowstone was the size of the Mississippi, and as deep. All the way north, everyone had been trying to convince Jasper that it didn't really make any difference how deep a river was, once it got deep enough to swim a horse. But Jasper felt the argument violated common sense. The deeper the river, the more dangerous. That was axiomatic to him. He had heard about something called undercurrents, which could suck you down. The deeper the river, the farther down you could be sucked, and Jasper had a profound fear of being sucked down. Particularly, he didn't want to be sucked down in the Yellowstone, and had made himself a pair of rude floats from some empty lard buckets just in case the Yellowstone really did turn out to be as deep as the Mississippi. I didn't come all this way just to drown in that last Dern River, Jasper said. It ain't the last, Augusta said. Montana don't stop at the Yellowstone. The Missouri's up there somewhere, and it's a whale of a river. Well, I don't aim to cross it, Jasper said. It seemed to him he had spent half the trip imagining how it would be to be sucked down into a deep river, and he wanted it understood that he was only willing to take so many chances. 
I guess you'll cross it if the captain wants you to keep going, Dish said. Jasper's river fears grated on everybody's nerves. Nobody liked crossing rivers, but it didn't help to talk about the dangers constantly for 3,000 miles. Well, Jake talked of a milk river and one called the Marais, Augustus said. Looks like you'd be satisfied, Jasper said. Ain't we traveled enough? I'd like to step into a saloon in good old Fort Worth myself. I'd like to see my home again while my folks are still alive. Why, that ain't the plan, Augustus said. We're up here to start a ranch. Home and hearth don't interest us. We hired you men for life. You ought to have said goodbye to the old folks before you left. What are we going to do now that we're here, Lippy asked. The question was on everyone's minds. Usually, when a cattle drive ended, the men just turned around and went back to Texas. But then most drives stopped in Kansas, which seemed close to home compared to where they were now. Many of them harbored secret doubts about their ability to navigate a successful return to Texas. Of course, they knew the direction, but they would have to make the trip in winter, and the Indians that hadn't been troublesome on the way north might want to fight as they went south. I like a town, Lippy added. It don't have to be St. Louis, just a town. As long as it has a saloon or two, I can get by. But I wasn't meant to live out in the open during the winter. Call knew the men were wondering, but he wasn't ready to stop. Jake had said some of the most beautiful land was far to the north, near Canada. It would be a pity to stop and make a choice before they had looked around thoroughly. He contemplated leaving the men and going on a long look around himself north of Yellowstone, but decided against it, mainly because of Indians. Things looked peaceful, but that didn't mean they would stay peaceful. There could easily be a bad fight, and he didn't want to be gone if one came. Finally, he decided to send Augustus. I hate to give you the first look, but somebody's got to look, he said. Would you want to go? Oh, sure, Augustus said. I'd be happy to get away from all this tedious conversation. Maybe I'll trot through this mild city community and see if anyone stocks champagne. Take the look around first, if you can be bothered, Call said. I doubt the main street of Mile City would make a good ranch, and I doubt you'll get any farther once you spot a saloon. We need to find a place and get some shelters built before winter hits. Take a man with you in case you get into trouble, Call suggested. I can get myself out of trouble, Augustus said. But if I have to lead some quaking spirit like Jasper Fant, it'll slow me down. None of these cowpokes is exactly wilderness hands. We buried the last reliable man down on the powder, remember? I remember, Call said. You don't want to make too many mistakes in this part of the country, Augustus said. You'll end up bear shit. Take P, Call said. P can follow orders. Yes, that's what he can do, Augustus said. I guess I'll take him, though he won't provide much conversation. P.I. was not enthusiastic about going on a scout with Gus, but since the captain told him to, he tied his bedroll on his saddle and got ready. Other than securing his bedroll, his preparations consisted mainly of sharpening his knife. One thing P.I. firmly believed was that it was foolish to start on a trip without a sharp knife. Inevitably, on a trip, there were things that needed cutting or skinning or trimming. Once his knife was sharp, P.I. was ready, more or less. He knew he wouldn't get much relaxation on the trip because he was traveling with Gus, and Gus talked all the time. It was hard to relax when he had to be constantly listening. Besides, Gus was always asking questions which were hard to understand, much less answer. It was a breezy morning when they started out. A dark cloud bank had formed in the northwest, and the men were talking of snow. I said, boy, back in Lonesome Dove, we'd be crossing the darn Yellowstone on the ice if we didn't get started, Jasper reminded them. Now all this time has passed, and I may be right. Even if you was right, you'd be wrong, Jasper, Augustus said as he stuffed an extra box or two of ammunition into his saddlebags. I'd like to know why, Gus, Jasper said, annoyed that Gus was always singling him out for criticism. I'll explain it when I get back, Augustus said. Come on, P, let's go see if we can find Canada. They loped off, watched by the whole camp. The crew had been made melancholy by the approaching clouds, Pocampo had wandered off looking for roots. Augustus and P.I. passed him nearly a mile from camp. Poe, you're a rambler, Augustus said. What do you expect to find on this old plain? 
Wild onions, Pocampo said. I'd like an onion. I'd like a jug of bourbon whiskey myself, Augustus said. I wonder which one of us will get his wish. Adios, Pocampo said. A day and a half later, the two scouts rode over a grassy bluff and saw the Yellowstone River a few miles away. Fifty or sixty buffalo were watering when they rode up. At the sight of the horsemen, the buffalo scattered. The cloud bank had blown away, and the blue sky was clear for as far as one could see. The river was swift, but not deep. Augustus paused in his crossing and leaned down, drinking from his cupped hands. The water was cold. Sweet water, but it don't compare with bourbon whiskey, he said. Jasper won't need them floats, P.I. remarked. He might, Augustus said. He might fall off his horse if he gets real nervous. Let's chase the buffalo for a while. Why, P. asked. Pocampo had packed them plenty of meat. He couldn't imagine why Gus would bother with buffalo. They were cumbersome to skin, and he and Gus had no need for so much meat. Nonetheless, it was follow or be left, for Augustus had loped off after the buffalo, who had only run about a mile. He soon put them to flight again, and raced along beside them, riding close to the herd. P.I., caught by surprise, was left far behind in the race. He kept expecting to hear Gus's big rifle, but he didn't, and after a run of about two miles came upon Gus sitting peacefully on a little rise. The buffalo were still running two or three miles ahead. Kill any? P. asked. No, I wasn't hunting, Augustus said. Did you just want to run them off or what? P. asked. As usual, Gus's behavior was a complete puzzle. P, you ain't got your grip on the point, Augusta said. I just wanted to chase a buffalo once more. I won't have the chance much longer, and nobody else will either, because there won't be no buffalo to chase. It's a grand sport, too. Them bulls can hook you, P.I. reminded him. Remember old Barlow? A buffalo bull hooked his horse, and the horse fell on Barlow and broke his hip. Barlow was a slow thinker, Augustus observed. He just loped along and got hooked. A slow walker, too, once his hip got broke, P.I. said. I wonder what happened to Barlow. I think he migrated to Seguin or somewhere over in there, Augustus said. Married a fat widow and had a passel of offspring. You ought to have done the same, but here you are in Montana. Well, I'd hate not to be a bachelor, P.I. said. Just because it's all you know don't mean it's all you'd enjoy, Augustus said. You had a chance at a fine widow right there in Lonesome Dove, as I recall. P.I. was sorry the subject of widows had come up. He had nearly forgotten the widow Cole, and the day he had helped her take the washing off the line, he didn't know why he hadn't forgotten it completely. He surely had forgotten more important things. Yet there it was, and from time to time it shoved into his brain. If he had married some widow, his brain would probably have been so full of such things that he would have no time to think, or even to keep his knife sharp. Ever meet any of the mountain men? Augustus asked. They got up in here and took the beavers. Well, I met old Kit, P.I. said. You ought to remember you was there. Yes, I remember, Augustus said. I never thought much of Kit Carson. Why, what was wrong with Kit Carson? P.I. asked. They say he could track anything. Kit was vain, Augustus said. I won't tolerate vanity in a man, though I will in a woman. If I had gone north in my youth, I might have got to be a mountain man, but I took to riverboating instead. The whores on them riverboats in my day barely wore enough clothes to pad a crutch. As they rode north, they saw more buffalo, mostly small bunches of twenty or thirty. The third day north of the Yellowstone, they killed a crippled buffalo calf and dined on its liver. In the morning, when they left, there were a number of buzzards and two or three prairie wolves hanging around, waiting for them to leave the carcass. It was a beautiful morning, crisp for an hour or two, and then sunny and warm. The country rolled on to the north as it had for thousands of miles, brown in the distance, the prairie grass waving in the breeze. Lord, how much land does the captain want? P.I. asked. Looks like this country around here would be good enough for anybody. Plenty would settle for it, you're right, Augusta said. Call might himself. But let's just go on for a day or two more. We ain't struck the Milk River yet. Does it run milk? P.I. asked. 
Now think a minute, P, Augusta said. How could it run milk when there ain't no cows up here yet? Why did they call it the milk, then? Milk is milk. Crazy is crazy, too, Augusta said. That's what I'll be before long from listening to you. Crazy. Well, Jasper's mind might break if he don't stop worrying about them rivers, P.I. allowed. I expect the rest of us will keep our wits. Augustus laughed heartily at the notion of the Hat Creek outfit keeping its wits. It's true they could be kept in a thimble, he said, but who brought a thimble? There was a little rise to the west, and Augustus loped over to it to see what the land looked like in that direction. P. trotted along north, as he had been doing, not paying much attention. Gus was always loping off to test the view, as he called it, and P. didn't feel obliged to follow him every time. Then P. heard the sound of a running horse and looked for Gus, supposing he had jumped another little bunch of buffalo. What he saw froze him instantly in place. Gus was racing down the little slope he had just gone up with at least twenty mounted Indians hot on his heels. He must have ridden right into them. The Indians were shooting both guns and arrows. A bullet cut the grass ahead of P. and he yanked out his rifle and popped a shot back at the Indians before whirling his horse and fleeing. Gus and he had crossed a good-sized creek less than an hour back, with some trees along it and some weeds and shrubbery in the creek bed. He assumed Gus must be racing for that, since it was the only shelter on the wide prairie. Even as he started, he saw five or six Indians veer toward him. He swerved over to join Gus, who had two arrows in his leg. Gus was flailing his horse with his rifle barrel, and the horse was running full out. Fortunately, the Indians were poorly mounted. Their horses were no match for the Hat Creek horses, and the two men soon widened the gap between them and their pursuers. They were out of range of arrows, and of bullets too, P. hoped, but he had hardly hoped it when a bullet stung him just above the shoulder blade. But the creek was only three or four miles ahead. If they could make it, there would be time enough to worry about wounds. Gus was trying to pull the arrows out of his leg as he rode, but he was having no luck. They saw the curve of the little creek from two miles away and angled for the nearest juncture. The Indians had fallen nearly a quarter of a mile back, but were still coming. When they struck the creek, Augustus raced along the bank until he found a spot where the weeds and brush were thickest. Then he jumped his horse off the bank and grabbed his saddlebags. Get all the ammunition you can, he said. We're in for a shooting match. And tie the horses in the best cover you can find, or they'll shoot them. This is long country to be afoot in. Then he hobbled to the bank, wishing he had time to cut the two arrows out of his leg. But if they were poisoned, it was already too late, and if he didn't do some fine shooting, it wouldn't matter anyway, because the Indians would overrun them. P. heard the big Henry rifle begin to roar as he dragged the sweating horses into the thickest part of the underbrush. It was thick but low, and he didn't think there was much chance for the horses. He yanked the saddlebags and bedrolls off both horses and was hiding them under the bank when Gus stopped firing for a moment. Get my saddle, he said. I'll show you a trick. Then he began to fire again. Evidently, he had turned the Indians, or they would already have been in the creek bed. P. dutifully got the saddle. When he got back, Gus was reloading. P. peeped over the bank and saw the Indians stopped some distance away. Many of them had dismounted and were standing behind their horses, using them as shields. How many did you kill? he asked. Not but three, Augustus said. This is a smart bunch we're up against. They seen right off a rush would cost them dear. P.I. watched the Indians for a while. They weren't yelling, and they didn't seem excited. I don't see what's so smart about them, he said. They're just standing there. Yes, but they're out of range, Augustus said. They're hoping to tempt me to waste ammunition. Augustus propped the saddle on the bank in such a way that he could shoot under it and be that much safer if the Indians shot back. He then proceeded to shoot six times rapidly. Five of the Indians' horses dropped, and a sixth ran squealing over the prairie. It fell several hundred yards away. The Indians fired several shots in reply, their bullets slicing harmlessly into the underbrush. The party of Indians then split. Several Indians went north of them, several south, and eight or ten stayed where they were. Well, we're practically surrounded, Augusta said. I don't expect we'll hear any more from them till dark. 
I'd hate to wait around here till dark, P.I. said. Did you know your shot? Augustus asked. P. had forgotten it. Sure enough, the front of his shirt was soaked with blood. He took it off, and Augustus examined the wound, which was clean. The bullet had gone right through. They turned their attention to the arrows in Augustus's left leg. Augustus twisted at them whenever he got a moment. One arrow he soon got out, but the other wouldn't budge. This one's in deep, he said. That brave wasn't more than 20 yards away when he let fly. I think it's worked under the bone, but it ain't poisoned. If it was, I'd be feeling it by now. P had a try at removing the arrow, while Gus gritted his teeth and held his leg steady with both hands. The arrow wouldn't budge. It wouldn't even turn, though P.I. twisted hard enough to cause a stream of blood to flow down Gus's leg. As they were working with the arrow, there was a sudden terrified squeal from the horses. Augustus hobbled over, drawing his pistol, and saw that both horses were down, their throats cut, their blood very bright on the green weeds and bushes. Stay back, P., he said, crouching. The Indian that had killed the horses was there somewhere in the underbrush, but he couldn't see him. Watch to the north, P., he said. I don't think these boys want to stay around here till dark either. He quickly wiped the sweat from his forehead. Keeping a bush directly in front of him, he edged very slowly to the bank, just high enough that he could see the tops of the weeds and underbrush. Then he waited. Once the dying horses finally stopped thrashing, it was very still. Augustus regretted that his preoccupation with the arrows had made him so lax that he had failed to protect the horses. It put them in a ticklish spot. It was over a hundred miles back to the Yellowstone, and in all likelihood the herd hadn't even got there yet. He kept his eyes focused on the tops of the underbrush. It was perfectly windless in the creek bottom, and if the underbrush moved, it would be because someone moved it. His big pistol was cocked. He didn't move, and time stretched out. Minutes passed. Augustus carefully kept the sweat wiped out of his eyes, concentrating on keeping his focus. The silence seemed to ring, it was so absolute. There were no flies buzzing yet, no birds flying, nothing. He would have bet the Indian was not twenty yards away from him, and yet he had no inkling of precisely where he was. "'Ain't you coming back, Gus?' P.I. asked after several minutes. Augustus didn't answer. He watched the tops of the weeds patiently. It was no time for hurry, much less for conversation. Patience was an Indian virtue. He himself didn't have it in day-to-day -day life, but he could summon it when it seemed essential. Then he heard a movement behind him and glanced around quickly to see if P. had suddenly decided to take a stroll. When he did, he saw the edge of a rifle extending an inch or two from the weeds, pointed not at himself but at P. He immediately fired twice into the weeds, and an Indian flopped over as a fish might flop. A second later, as the echo of the gun died, he heard a click a few yards to his right. He whirled and fired at it. A moment later, the underbrush began to shake as if a huge snake were wiggling through it. Augustus ran into the weeds and saw the wounded Indian trying to crawl away. He at once shot him in the back of the head and didn't stop to turn him over. Backing out of the weeds, he stepped on the pistol that had misfired, an old cap and ball gun. He stuck it in his belt and hurried back to P, who looked white. He had sense enough to realize he had just almost been shot. Augustus glanced at the other dead Indian, a fat boy of maybe seventeen. His rifle was an old Sharps carbine, which Augustus threw to P. We gotta move, he said. This cover's working against us. But for luck, we'd both be dead now already. What we need is a stretch with a steep bank and no cover. They worked their way upstream, carrying the saddle, saddlebags and guns, for nearly a mile, hugging the bank. Augustus was limping badly, but didn't stop to worry about it. Finally, they came to a bend in the creek where the bank was sheer and about ten feet high. The creek bottom was nearly bare of foliage. Let's dig, Augustus said, and began to work with his knife to create a shallow cave under the bank. They worked furiously for half an hour until both were drenched with sweat and covered with dirt. Augustus used the stock of the Indian boy's carbine as a rude shovel and tried to shape the dirt that raked out into low breastworks on either side of the cave. They watched as best they could, but saw no Indians. Maybe they gave up, P.I. said. You killed five so far. 
five reasons why they won't give up, Augustus said. They'll fight for their dead since they expect to meet them again. Ain't you learned that by now? P.I. could not be sure that he had learned anything about Indians, except that he was scared of them, and he had learned that long before he ever saw one. The digging was hard work, but they didn't dare stop. The Indians might show up at any time. Which Indians is these we're fighting, he asked. They didn't introduce themselves, P., Augusta said. It might be written on those arrows. I'm going to be one-legged if we don't get this other arrow out pretty soon. No sooner had he said it than it began to rain arrows, all arching over the south bank of the creek. Crawl in, Augusta said. He and P scrunched back into the cave and stacked the saddlebags in front of them. Many of the arrows went over the creek bed entirely and into the prairie on the other side. A few struck in the earthworks they had thrown up, and one or two fell in the water. They're just hoping to get lucky, Augusta said. If my darn leg was better, I'd sneak over to the other side of the creek and whittle down the odds a little more. The shower of arrows soon stopped, but the two men stayed in the cave, taking no chances. I've got to push this arrow on through, Augusta said. I may pass out, and if I do, I better do it now. When it gets dark, we'll both need to be watching. He stopped talking and listened. He put his finger to his lips so P.I. would be quiet. Someone was on the bank above them, at least one Indian, maybe more. He motioned to P. to have his pistol ready in case the Indians tried to rush them. Augustus was hoping for a rush, confident that with the two of them shooting, they could decimate the Indians to such an extent that the survivors might leave. If the Indians couldn't be discouraged and driven off, then the situation was serious. They had no horses, the herd was more than a hundred miles away, and he was crippled. They could follow the creek down to the Yellowstone and perhaps strike Miles City, but it would be a slow trip for him to make crippled. Given his choice of gambles, he would prefer a fight. They might even be able to catch one of the Indian horses. But the rush never came. Whoever was above them left. The creek bank on their side was already in shadow. Augustus uncocked his pistol and stretched his leg out again. He knew better than to put off anything to do with wounds, so he grasped the arrow and began to push it on through his leg. The pain was severe and caused a cold sweat to break out, but at least the arrow moved. My lord, Gus, you're shot too, P.I. said. When Augustus bent over to twist the arrow, P. noticed that the back of his shirt, down low near his belt, was caked with blood. The dirt from their diggings had covered it, but there was no doubt that it was blood. One wound at a time, Augustus said. It took both hands to move the arrow. The skin on his leg began to bulge. Cut, he said to P. Pretend I'm snake bit. P went white. He hated even looking at wounds. The thought of cutting Gus made him want to be sick, but the fact that he had a sharp knife helped. He barely touched the skin, and the cut was made. The bloody tip of the arrow poked through. Gus shoved the tip on out and then fainted. P.I. had to pull the arrow on through. It was as hard as pulling a bolt out of a board, but he got it out. Then he felt deeply frightened. If the Indians came now, they were lost, he felt sure. He cocked his pistol and Gus's and held them both at the ready until his hands grew tired. His head was throbbing. He laid the guns down and wet Gus's forehead from the water bag, hoping Gus would revive. If the Indians came, he would have to shoot quick, and his best shooting had always been done slowly. He liked to take a fine aim. It seemed Gus would never revive. P.I. thought he might be dying, although he could hear him breathing. Finally, Gus opened his eyes. His breathing was ragged, but he reached over and took his pistol back, as if he had just awakened from a refreshing nap. Then, to P.I.'s amazement, he crawled out of the cave, hobbled down to the water's edge, and dug in the mud with his knife. He came back with a handful of mud the size of a cannonball. Montana mud, he said. I ain't happy about this wound. Maybe this mud will cool it off. He covered his wound with mud and offered P some. It's free mud, he said. Take some. Then he felt behind him, trying to judge the wound in his back that P had drawn attention to. It wasn't a bullet, he concluded. I could feel a bullet. It was probably another arrow, only it jiggled out during that run. The twilight was deepening. 
the creek bed in shadow, though the upper sky was still light. I'll watch west and you watch east, Augusta said. Almost as soon as he finished speaking, a shot hit the cave bank just above their heads, causing dirt to shower down. Augustus looked down the creek and saw two horsemen cross it, too far away to make accurate targets in the dusk. I guess we're fairly surrounded, he said, some downstream and some upstream. I don't see why we didn't stay in Texas, P.I. said. The Indians was mostly whipped down there. Well, this is just bad luck we're having, Augustus said. We just run into a little bunch of fighters. I imagine they're about as scarce as the buffalo. Reckon we can hold them off until the captain comes and looks for us? P. asked. Yes, if I don't get sick from this leg, Augustus said. This leg don't feel right. If it don't heal, you may have to go for help. The thought frightened P. I. badly. Go for help when Gus had just said they were surrounded? Go and be scalped was what that was an invitation to. I expect they'd catch me if I tried that, P. said. Maybe the captain will figure out that we're in trouble and hurry on up here. He won't miss us for another week, Augusta said. I don't fancy squatting here by this creek for a week. A few minutes later, they heard a loud, strange cry from the east. It was an Indian war cry. Another came from the west and several from the far bank of the river. The evening would be still and peaceful for a few minutes, and then the war cries would start again. He had never approved of the way Indians yelled when they fought. It upset his nerves. This yelling was no exception. Some of the cries were so piercing that he wanted to hold his ears. Augustus, however, listened with appreciation. The war cries continued for an hour. In a lull, Augustus cupped his hands and let out a long, loud cry himself. He kept it up until he ran out of breath. P.I. had never heard Augustus yell like that and hardly knew what to make of it. It sounded exactly like a Comanche war cry. The Indians surrounding them apparently didn't know what to make of it either. When Gus stopped yelling, they did too. I was just thanking them for the concert, Augustus said. Remember that old Comanche that went blind and used to hang around the fort? He taught me that. I doubt they've ever heard Comanche up in these parts. It might spook them a little. Reckon they'll sneak up in the dark? P. asked. That was his lifelong worry, being snuck up on in the dark by an Indian. I doubt it, Augusta said. The eyesight of your average Indian is overrated. They spend too much time in them smoky teepees. The bulk of them can't see in the dark no better than we can, if as well. So it's a big chance for them, sneaking up on sharpshooters like us. Well, I ain't a sharpshooter, P. I. said. I need to take a good aim or else I miss. You're near as depressing as Jasper Fant, Augustus said. No Indians came in the night, and Augustus was glad of that. He began to feel feverish and was afraid of taking a chill. He had to cover himself with saddle blankets, though he kept his gun hand free and managed to stay awake most of the night, unlike P, who snored beside him, as deeply asleep as if he were in a feather bed. By morning, Augustus had a high fever. Though his leg worried him most, he also had pain in his side. He decided he had been wrong in his first analysis and that he did have a bullet wound there after all. The fever had him feeling weak. While he was waiting, pistol cocked, to see if the Indians would try to rush them, he heard thunder. Within half an hour, lightning was striking all around them and thunder crashing. Oh, darn, P.I. said. Now I guess we'll get lightning struck. Go back to sleep if all you can do is be pessimistic, Augustus said. I smell rain, which is a blessing. Indians mostly don't like to fight in the wet. Only white men are dumb enough just to keep on fighting no matter what the weather is like. We've fought Indians in the wet, P.I. said. Yes, but it was us forced it on them, Augustus said. They'd rather do battle on sunny days, which is only sensible. Here they're probably going to kill us, and you take up for them, P.I. said. He had never understood Gus and never would, even if the Indians didn't kill them. I'm an admirer of good sense wherever I find it, Augusta said. I hope you find some today, then, and get us out of this, P. said. Then it began to rain in earnest. It rained so hard that it became impossible to see or even talk. A muddy stream began to pour off the bank, only inches in front of them. 
the rain struck so hard it reminded P of driving nails. Usually such freshets were short-lived, but this one wasn't. It seemed to rain for hours and was still raining when dawn came, though not as hard. Alarmingly, to P, the creek had become a river, more than deep enough to swim a horse. It rose so that it was only two or three yards in from where they were scrunched into the cave, and it soon washed away their crude breastwork. And it was still raining. It was cold, too, though fortunately they had a good overhang and were fairly dry. Gus had drugged the bedrolls in before the rain started. P was shocked to see that Gus didn't look himself. His face was drawn and his hands unsteady. He was chewing on some jerky he had pulled out of a saddlebag, but it seemed he barely had the strength to eat. Are you poorly? P asked. I should have got that arrow out sooner, Augusta said. This leg's going to give me problems. He handed P some jerky, and they sat in silence for a while, watching the brown flood sweep past them. Hell, a frog could have waded that creek yesterday, P said. Now look at it. It's still raining, too. We may get drowned instead of scalped. It's a good thing Jasper ain't here, he added. He's mighty afraid of water. Actually, this flood is an opportunity for you, Augusta said. If we can last to the day, you might swim past them tonight and get away. Well, but that wouldn't be right, P.I. said. I wouldn't want just to leave you sitting here. I won't be sitting. I'll be floating if this keeps up, Augustus said. The good aspect of it is that it might cool off these Indians. They might go back to their families and let us be. I'd hate to leave you even so, P. said. You can't carry me to the herd, and I doubt I can walk it, Augustus said. I'm running such a fever I'm apt to go out of my head any time. You'll probably have to trot back and bring some of the boys, or maybe the wagon. Then I can ride back in style. The thought struck P.I. for the first time that Gus might die. He had no color, and he was shaking. It had never been suggested that Gus might die. Of course, he knew any man could die. P. himself had seen many die. Yet it was a condition he had never associated with Gus McRae or with the captain either. They were not normal men as he understood normal, and he had never reckoned with the possibility that either of them might die. Now, when he looked at Gus and saw his pallor and his shakes, the thought came into his mind and wouldn't leave. Gus might die. P. knew at once that he had to do everything possible to prevent it. If he went back to the wagon and reported that Gus was dead, there was no telling what the captain would say yet he didn't know exactly what he could do. They had no medicine, it was raining fits, the Indians had them surrounded, and they were a hundred miles or more from the Hat Creek outfit. It's a soggy situation, I admit, Augustus said as if reading P.I.'s thoughts, but it ain't fatal yet. I could hold out here for a few days. Call could make it back to this creek in one ride on that feisty mare of his. Best thing for you to do would be just to travel at night. If you walk around in the daytime, some of these red boys might spot you, and you'd have about the chance of a rabbit. I guess you could make it to the Yellowstone in three nights, though, and they ought to be there by then. P.I. dreaded the prospect. He hated night travel, and it would be worse afoot. He began to hope that maybe the rain had discouraged the Indians, but that hope only lasted an hour. Three times during the day the Indians fired on them. They shot from downriver and Gus opened up on them at once. They were so respectful of his gun that their bullets only splattered uselessly in the mud, or else hit the water and ricocheted off with a whine. Gus looked so weak and shaky that P.I. wondered if he could still shoot accurately. But the question was answered later in the day when an Indian tried to shoot them from the opposite bank, using a little rain squall as cover. He got off his shot, which hit one of the saddles, then Gus shot him as he turned to crawl away. The shot caused the Indian to straighten up, and Gus shot him again. The second bullet seemed to suck the Indian backward. He toppled off the bank and rolled into the water. He was not dead. He tried to swim, so Gus shot him again. A minute or two later, he floated past them, face down. I expect he would have drowned, P.I. said, thinking it wasteful of Gus to shoot the man three times. He might have, or he might have lived to cut off your nuts, Augustus said. There were no more attacks that day, but there was no doubt that the Indians were still there. 
Before sundown, they raised their war cries again. This time, Augustus didn't answer. The day had never been bright, but it seemed to linger. There was a long, rainy dusk, so long that it made P.I. feel gloomy. It was cramped in the cave. He longed to stretch his legs, and then made the foolish mistake of saying so to Gus. Wait till it's full dark, Augusta said. Then you can stretch them. What if I get lost, P.I. said. I ain't never been in this country. Go south, Augusta said. That's all you have to remember. If you mess up and go north, a polar bear will eat you. Yes, and a grizzly bear might if I go south, P.I. said with some bitterness. Either way, I'll be dead. He regretted that Gus had mentioned bears. Bears had been preying on his mind since the Texas bull had had his great fight. It struck him that things were tough up here in the north. It had taken Gus three shots to kill a small Indian. How many shots would it take to kill a grizzly bear? Well, you ought to start, P., Augustus said finally. It had been dark for over an hour, and the Indians were silent. That darn water looks cold, P.I. said. I was never one for cold baths. Well, I'm sorry we didn't bring a bathtub and a cook stove, Augustus said. If we had, we could heat some water for you, but as it is, you'll just have to rough it. The rain stopped, the creek could start going down any time, and the more water in it, the better for you. Get out in the middle and pretend you're a muskrat. P.I. was half a mind not to go. He had never disobeyed an order in his life, but this time he was sorely tempted, and it was not just the cold swim or the chancy trek that made him hesitate. It was leaving Gus. Gus was close to being out of his head. If he went on out of his head, the Indians would have a good chance to get him. He sat for a while, trying to think of some argument that would make Gus let him stay with him. Maybe we could both swim out, he said. I know you're crippled, but you could lean on me once we started walking. P. Go, Augustus said. I ain't getting well, I'm getting sicker. If you want to help, go get Captain Call. Have him lope up here with an extra horse and tote me over to Miles City. P.I. got ready with a heavy heart. It all seemed wrong, and none of it would have happened if they'd just stayed in Texas. Just take your rifle, Augustus said. A pistol won't do you no good if you have to stop one of them bears. Besides, I'll need both pistols. Any fighting that happens here will be close-range work. I can't swim and hold a darn rifle, Gus, P.I. said. Stick it through your belt and down your pants leg, Augustus said. You can float downstream. You won't actually have to swim much. P.I. took off his boots and his shirt and made a bundle of them. Then he did as Gus ordered and stuck his rifle through his belt. He stuffed some jerky in one boot for provisions. All he needed to do was leave, but it was hard. Now go on, P., Augustus said. Go get the captain and don't worry about me. Don't let the Indians catch you, whatever you do. Gus reached out a hand, and P.I. realized he was offering a handshake. P.I. shook his hand, feeling terribly sad. Gus, I never thought I'd be leaving you, he said. Well, you are, though, Augustus said. Trod carefully. It was then that the conviction struck P.I. that he would never see Gus alive again. Mainly, what they were into was just another Indian fight, and all of those had inconveniences. But Gus had never sustained a wound before that P. could remember. The arrows and bullets that had missed him so many times had finally found him. After the handshake, Gus treated him as if he were already gone. He didn't offer any messages or say another word. P.I. wanted to say something else, but couldn't think what. Feeling very disconsolate, he waded into the cool water. It was far colder than he had supposed. His legs at once felt numb. He looked back once and could dimly see the cave, but not Gus. As soon as he reached swimming depth, he forgot Gus and everything else due to a fear of drowning. The icy water pushed him under at once. Floating wasn't as easy as Gus had made it seem. The rifle was a big problem. Stuck in his pants leg, it seemed to weigh like lead. Also, he had no experience in such fast water. Several times he got swept over to the side of the creek and almost got tangled in the underbrush that the rushing water covered. Worse than that, he almost immediately lost the little bundle of boots and pants, shirt, all his provisions, and part of his ammunition. 
He had reached down with one hand to try and move the rifle a little higher up on his leg, and the water sucked the bundle away and swept it far ahead of him. P.I. began to realize that he was going to drown unless he did better than he was doing. The water pushed him under several times. He wanted badly to climb up the bank, but was by no means sure he was past the Indians. Gus said to go down at least a mile, and he wasn't sure he had gone that far. The water had a suck to it that he had constantly to fight against. To his horror, he felt it sucking his pants off. He had been so disconsolate when he walked into the river that he had not buckled his belt tightly. He had nothing much in the way of hips, and the water sucked his pants down past them. The rifle sight was gouging him in the leg. He grabbed the rifle, but then went under. The dragging pants with the rifle in one leg were drowning him. He began to try frantically to get them off so as to have the free use of his legs. He wanted to cuss Gus for having suggested sticking the rifle in his pants leg. He could never get it out in time to shoot an Indian if one appeared, and it was causing him terrible aggravation. He fought to the surface again, went under, and when he came up wanted to yell for help, and then remembered there would be no one around to hear him but Indians. Then his leg was almost jerked off. He had been swept close to the bank, and the dragging gun had caught in some underbrush. The bank was only a few feet away, and he tried to claw over to it, but that didn't work. While he was struggling, the pants came off, and he was swept down the river backwards. One minute he could see the south bank of the river, and the next minute all he could see was water. Twice he opened his mouth to suck in air and sucked in water instead, some of which came back out his nose. His legs and feet were so numb from the cold water that he couldn't feel them. He never remembered getting out of the water, but somehow he did, for when he next took note of things he was laying in the mud, his feet still in the water. He was stark naked and the mud was cold, so he pulled himself up and laboriously climbed the bank. It was only eight or ten feet high, but it was slippery. When he got up he wanted to lay in the grass and go to sleep, but he was awake enough to think about his situation, and thinking soon made him wakeful. He hadn't drowned, but he was naked, unarmed, without food, and something like a hundred miles from the Hat Creek wagon. He didn't know the country and was up against some tough Indians who did. Gus was sick and maybe dying somewhere upriver. It would be daylight in a few hours and the danger from Indians would increase. P.I. at once started walking as fast as he could. Though it had stopped raining, it was still cloudy, and he could not see one star or the moon or, for that matter, anything either on heaven or earth. The awful thought struck him that, rolling around and around in the water, he might even have confused north and south and crawled up the wrong bank. He might be walking north, in which case he was as good as dead, but he couldn't stop to worry about it. He had to move. He had lost his pack and his gun in the river, and as soon as the river sank to being a normal stream again, they would all be lying in the creek bed in plain sight. If the Indians found them, they would know he was gone and that Gus was alone, which would make things hot for Gus. If they were in a tracking mood, it would also make things hot for him. They had horses and could run him down in a matter of hours. The faster he traveled, the better chance he had. After he had thought about it for a while, P. was profoundly glad the night was so dark. He wished it could stay dark forever, or at least until he pulled in sight of the herd. When he thought of all the perils he was exposed to, it was all he could do to keep from running. He remembered vividly all the things Indians did to white men. In his rangering days he had helped bury several men who had had such things done to them, and memories of those charred and gouged corpses was with him in the darkness. With him, too, and just as terrifying, was the memory of the great orange bear who had nearly ripped the Texas bull wide open. He remembered how fast the bear had gone when they tried to chase it on horseback. If such a bear spotted him, he felt he would probably just lie down and give up. The darkness didn't last. The only blessing the light brought was that P.I. caught a glimpse of the North Star as the clouds were breaking. He knew at least that he was going in the right direction. The sun soon came up, and he remembered Gus's warning not to travel in the daytime. P.I. decided to ignore it. For one thing, he was on an absolutely open plain, where there was no good place to hide. 
He might as well be moving as sitting. When he looked ahead, he felt very discouraged, for the country seemed endless. It seemed to him he could see almost a hundred miles, just empty country, and he had to walk it. He had never been an advocate of walking, and coming up the trail horseback had given him even less affection for it. He had never bargained for doing so much walking, especially barefoot. Before he had gone more than a few miles, his feet were cut and sore. The plains looked grassy and smooth, but there were rocks scattered here and there, and he stepped on a goodly number of them. Also, it embarrassed him that he was naked. Of course, there was no one around to see him, but he could see himself, and it was disconcerting. The captain would be mighty surprised to see him come tramping up naked. The boys would undoubtedly think it hilarious and would kid him about it for weeks. At first, the nakedness worried him almost as much as his sore feet, but before he had walked half a day, his feet hurt so much that he had stopped caring whether he was naked or even alive. He had to wade two little creeks, and he got into some thorny underbrush in one of them. Soon every step was painful, but he knew he had to keep walking, or he would never find the boys. Every time he looked back, he expected to see either Indians or a bear. By evening, he was just stumbling along. He found a good patch of high grass and weeds and lay down to sleep for a while. He woke up bitterly cold to find it was snowing. A squall had blown in. P.I. heard a strange sound and took a minute to realize it was his own chattering teeth. His feet were so sore he could scarcely walk on them and the snow didn't help. It was a wet snow, melting almost as it fell, but that didn't make it much more comfortable. Somehow he hobbled south all night. The snow soon stopped, but his feet were very cold, and every time he stepped on a rock in the dark they hurt so he could hardly keep from crying out. He felt very weak and empty and knew he wasn't making very good time. He bitterly regretted not having hung on to some of the jerky or his rifle or something. Gus would think him a fine fool if he found out he had lost everything before he even got clear of the creek. In his weariness, he even forgot for a time that Gus had been left in the little cave. Several times he spoke to Gus as he stumbled along, mainly asking directions. For a time, he felt Gus was just ahead, leading the way. Or was it Dietz? P.I. felt confused. Whoever it was wouldn't speak to him, and yet he continued to ask questions. He took comfort in thinking Gus or Dietz was there. They were the best scouts they would lead him in. When the second day dawned, P.I. stopped to rest. He realized no one was with him unless it was ghosts. But then it might be ghosts. Gus might be dead by then, and Dietz was for sure. Maybe one of them, having nothing to do, had decided to float along ahead of him, guiding him to the Yellowstone. When he looked at his feet, it seemed to him that he might make almost as good time crawling or walking on his hands. His feet were swollen to twice their size, besides being cut here and there. Yet they were the only feet he had, and after dozing for an hour in the sun, he got up and hobbled on. He was very hungry and wished he had paid more attention to Pocampo, who could find things to eat just by walking along looking. P. tried to look, but he saw nothing but grass and weeds. Fortunately, he struck several small creeks and had plenty of water. Once he even managed to sluice some minnows up on dry land, they wiggled and flopped and were hard to catch, and of course they only made a few bites, but they were better than nothing. His biggest piece of luck came late that day when he was able to knock over a big prairie chicken with a rock. He only broke the bird's wing and had to chase it through the grass a long way, but the bird tired before he did, and he finally caught it, skinned it, and ate it raw. He rested three hours and then hobbled on through another night. The third morning he could barely make himself move. His feet were worse than ever, the plains ahead still endless and empty. His eyes ached from looking so hard for the line of the Yellowstone, but he still couldn't see it. It was the emptiness that discouraged him most. He had almost stopped worrying about Indians and bears. What he worried about was being lost. He knew by the stars he was still going south, but south where? Maybe he had veered east of the herd or west of it, so that no one would spot him. 
Maybe he had already passed them, in which case there was little hope. The snows would just come and freeze him, or else he would starve. He lay until mid-morning, unable to decide what to do. For a time, he thought the best plan might be just to sit. There were supposed to be soldiers in Montana somewhere. If he sat long enough, maybe some would find him. Finally, though, he got up and stumbled on. The soldiers would only find his bones if they found anything. It was a blazing day, so hot it made him feel annoyed at Montana weather. What kind of country was it where you could get frostbite one night and sunburn two days later? He saw a couple of prairie dogs and wasted an hour trying to get one with a rock, but the prairie dogs were smarter than prairie chickens, and he never came close. He stumbled on, feeling that the sun would burn off what skin he had left. Several times during the afternoon he fell. He grew light-headed and felt as if he were floating. Then his swollen feet would refuse to work, and instead of floating he would fall. Once he came to, lying flat on his back in the grass, the sun burning into his eyes. He scrambled up and looked around, feeling that the herd might have walked right past him when he slept. He tried very hard to walk a straight line south, but his legs were so weak that he kept wobbling off course. "'Dern you, walk straight,' he said. The sound of his own cracked voice startled him out of his fury. Then he felt embarrassed. A man who would cuss his own legs just because they were weak was peculiar, he knew. He got the floating feeling again, so strong that he felt frightened. He felt he might be going to float right out of his own body. He wondered if he was dying, if that was how it felt. He had never heard of anyone dying while they were just walking along. But then dying was something he knew little about. He would take a few steps and then feel himself begin to rise out of his own body, which frightened him so that he stumbled and fell. He didn't want to stand up again, and he began to crawl, looking up now and then to see if the herd was in sight. He felt he couldn't live another night so alone and hungry. He would die in the grass like some beaten animal. Then it grew dark, and he wanted to cry with disappointment. He had walked long enough. Surely it was time the boys showed up. Once it was full dark, he stopped and listened. He felt the herd might be close, and if he listened, maybe he would hear the Irishman singing. He heard no singing, but when he got up and tried to stumble on, he felt the presence of his guide again. This time he knew it was Dietz. He couldn't see him because it was dark, and of course Dietz was dark, but he lost the floating feeling and walked easier, though he was a little scared. He didn't know what the rules were with people who were dead. He would have liked to say something, but felt he shouldn't. Dietz might go away and leave him to stumble along in the dark if he said anything. Maybe travel was no trouble for the dead, P didn't know. It was a considerable trouble for him. He walked slow, for he didn't like to fall, but he walked on all night. Two hours after sunup the next day, Dish Boggett, who had been sent off to do a little scout, thought he saw a figure far to the north. At first he couldn't tell if it was a man or an antelope. If it was a man, it was an Indian, he imagined, and he raced back to the herd and got the captain, who had been shooing the mare, always an arduous task. She hated anyone to handle her feet and had to be securely snubbed before she would submit to it. Fortunately, call was finished, and he rode back with Dish to look for the man. There was no sign of him at first, but Dish had a good eye for country and knew where he had seen him. Call privately supposed it had only been an antelope, but he wanted to check. They had crossed the Yellowstone the day before. The men and all the stock had got across safely. Jasper Fant was in his best mood of the trip, having survived all the rivers after all. There he is, Dish said suddenly. If it ain't P. Dish was almost stunned with surprise. P was no longer walking. He was sitting down in the grass, naked, nodding his head as if in conversation with somebody. When he heard them, he looked around, as if not particularly surprised, but when they dismounted, there were tears in his eyes. Howdy, Captain, P.I. said, embarrassed by his own emotion. You just missed Dietz, I guess. Call saw that P.I. was wounded and out of his head. There was blood on his chest from a shoulder wound. The sun had blotched his body and his feet were swollen the size of a cow's bladder 
and cut to shreds. Is Gus dead? Call asked, afraid to hear the answer. Though he knew Gus's penchant for trouble, it was a shock to see P.I. in such a state. P.I. had been thinking of Dietz, who had kindly walked him through the night. He was embarrassed to be naked, and he found it hard to turn his mind back to where he could deal with the question the captain had asked him. The creek's up. It's why I lost my clothes, he said. Call untied his slicker from his saddle and covered P.I. with it. P.I. immediately felt better. He tried to button the slicker so his dingus wouldn't show, but his fingers shook and Dish Boggett finally did it for him. Is Gus dead? Call asked again. P.I. let his mind turn slowly. Then he remembered that Gus had been sitting with two guns in his hands, not saying a word, when he waded into the river. He had had that bad wound in his leg. The creek was up when I left him, P.I. said. I had to swim down past the Indians, and I lost all my gear. Gus kept my pistol. Where was this? Call asked. Up north, Captain, P.I. said. We dug a cave in a river bank, that's all I know. But he wasn't dead when you left him? No, he sent me off, P said. He said he wanted you to lope on up there and help him with those Indians. Dish Boggett could not adjust to the fact that P.I. was naked and all scarred up. They had had such a peaceful time of it that he had lost the sense that they were in dangerous country. What was that about Dietz, he asked. Helped me, P said simply. Are we going after Gus, Captain? We had a hard time getting one of them arrows out, and his leg was giving him pain. You're going to the wagon, Call said. You need some grub. How many Indians were there? P tried to think. A bunch jumped us, he said. About twenty, I guess. Gus shot a few. Call and Dish had to lift him. All strength seemed to have left him, now that he knew he was safe. Dish had to hold him on his horse as they rode back for P.I. had so little strength he could not even grip the saddle horn. The crew, which had been in high spirits and drunk on their own celebrity, for weren't they the first men to bring a Texas herd across the Yellowstone, sobered up immediately when they saw the condition P.I. was in. Why, well, hello, boys, P. said when he was helped off the horse. They all gathered around to greet him, and Bert and Needle Nelson helped him down. Pocampo had some coffee ready. P. reached out for a cup once they had him propped against the wagon, but his hands were too shaky to hold it. Poe fed him a little with a spoon, and between one sip and the next, P. slid from his position and passed out. He collapsed so quickly that no one even caught him. Is he dead? Newt asked, anxious. No, just tuckered out, Call said. He was filling his saddlebags with ammunition, glad that he had got new shoes on the mare. He said Dietz helped him, Dish Boggett said. The way P. said it had unnerved him. Dietz was dead and buried back on the Powder River. Call didn't answer. He was pondering the question of whether to take a man with him. I guess he was out of his head, Dish said. I guess that explains it. Pocampo smiled. The dead can help us if we let them and if they want to, he said. Jasper Fant, delighted not to be among the dead, looked at Poe severely. Ain't none ever helped me except my own pa, he said. How'd he help you? Needle asked. Left me twenty dollars in his will. I bought this saddle with it, and I've been a cowboy ever since. You call yourself one, you mean, Soupy Jones said. He had poor relations with Jasper as a result of a dispute over cards. I'm here, ain't I? Jasper said. Just because you lost that hand don't mean I can't cow. Oh, shut your trap, Jasper, Dish said. He had had enough of Jasper and Soupy, and felt that the whole question of P and Dietz had been treated too brusquely. After all, the first words P had said was that they had just missed Dietz. Dish didn't want to admit it, but he had been scared of ghosts all his life, and didn't like to think that any were wandering around. It would just make night herding more nerve-wracking, even if the ghost in question was one that might be friendly to him. Then someone noticed that Captain Call was leaving. He took an extra rifle from the wagon and got the slicker that he had lent P, covering P with a blanket. Just move the stock on north, he said. Be alert. I'm going to get Gus. 
The thought of him leaving sent a ripple of apprehension through the camp. Though independent to a man in some respects, the outfit was happier in all respects when Captain Call was around, or if not the captain, then Gus. Only a few hours earlier they had felt cocky enough to take on an army. After all, they were the conquerors of the Yellowstone. But now, watching the captain catch a horse for Gus to ride back on, they all felt daunted. The vast plain was beautiful, but it had reduced P.I. to a scarred wreck, and the Indians had Gus holed up somewhere. They might kill him and the captain, too. All men were mortal, and they felt particularly so. A thousand Indians might come by nightfall. The Indians might fall on them as they had fallen on Custer. Call had no time to soothe the men with elaborate instructions. If Gus was badly wounded, he would weaken rapidly, and every hour counted. Arriving ten minutes too late would be as bad as ten days, or a year for that matter. Besides, the almost beseeching way the men looked at him was irritating. Sometimes they acted as if they would forget how to breathe if he or Gus wasn't there to show them. They were all resourceful men, he knew that if they didn't, and yet at certain times they became like children wanting to be led. All his adult life he had consented to lead, and yet occasionally, when the men seemed particularly dumbstruck, he wondered why he had done it. He and Augustus had discussed the question of leadership many times. It ain't complicated, Augustus maintained. Most men doubt their own abilities. You don't. It's no wonder they want to keep you around. It keeps them from having to worry about failure all the time. They ain't failures, most of them, Call pointed out. They can do perfectly well for themselves. Augustus chuckled. You work too hard, he said. It puts most men to shame. They figure out they can't keep up, and it's just a step or two from that to feeling that they can't do nothing much unless you're around to get them started. It don't take on me, which is lucky, he added. I don't care how hard you work or where you go. I'd like to see something that could put you to shame, Call said. My pecker's done it a few times, Augustus said. Call wondered what he meant by that, but didn't ask. When he was packed, he mounted at once and rode over to Dish Boggett. You're in charge, he said. Trail on north. I'll be back when I can. Dish paled at the thought of so much responsibility. He had enough worries as it was, what with P.I. talking of ghosts. The captain looked angry, which made the men better reconciled to the fact that he was leaving. All of them feared his angers, but once he left, before he and the mare were even out of sight, their mood of relief changed back to one of apprehension. Jasper Fant, so cheerful only an hour before, sank the fastest. Good Lord, he said, here we are in Montana, and there's Indians and bears, and it's winter coming on, and the captain and Gus both off somewhere. I'll be surprised if we don't get massacred. For once, Soupy Jones didn't have a word to say. Chapter 95 Augustus kept his pistol cocked all night once P.I. left. He watched the surface of the river closely, for the trick he hoped might work for P. could also work for the Indians. They might put a log in the water and float down on him, using the log for cover. He tried to look and listen closely, a task not helped by the fact that he was shaking and feverish. He expected the Indians to come sliding out of the water like big snakes right in front of him, but none came and as his fever mounted, he began to mumble. From time to time, he was half aware that he was delirious, but there was nothing he could do about it, and anyway, he preferred the delirium to the tedium of waiting for the Indians to attack. One minute, he would be trying to watch the black water. The next, he would be back at Clara's. At times, he saw her face vividly. The dawn broke sunny. Bad as he felt, Augustus still enjoyed seeing the sun. It helped clear his head and stirred him to thoughts of escape. He was sick of the little cold cave under the river bank. He had thought to wait there for call, but the more he considered, the more he felt it to be a bad plan. Call's arrival was days away and dependent on P getting through. If P didn't get through, and the chances were good that he wouldn't, then Call might not even start to look for him for another week. 
As a student of wounds, he knew just by looking at his leg that he was in trouble. The leg was yellowish, with black streaks striping the yellow. Blood poisoning was a possibility. He knew that if he didn't get medical attention within the next few days, his chances were slim. Even waiting for nightfall might be folly. If the Indians caught him in the open, his chances would be equally slim, of course. But it took no deliberation to know that if he had to choose, and he did, he would prefer the active to the passive course. As soon as the sun was well up, he eased out of the cave and stood up. The bad leg throbbed. Even to touch his toes to the ground hurt. The waters were rapidly receding. Fifty yards to the east, a game trail led up the creek bank. Augustus decided to use the carbine he had taken off the Indian boy as a crutch. He cut the stirrups off the saddle and lashed one over each end of the rifle, then padded one end of his rude crutch with a piece of saddle leather. He stuffed one pistol under his belt, holstered the other, took his rifle and a pocket full of jerky, and hobbled across along the bank to the animal trail. He edged cautiously out of the riverbed, but saw no Indians. The broad plain was empty for miles. The Indians had left. Augustus wasted no time in speculation. He started at once, hobbling southeast toward Miles City. He hoped he had not more than thirty or forty miles to go before he struck the town. He was not used to the crutch, and he made poor time. When occasionally he forgot and set his bad foot to the ground, the pain was almost enough to make him pass out. He was weak and had to stop every hour or so to rest. In the hot sun, sweat poured out of him, though he felt cold and feared a chill. Two or three miles from where he started, he crossed the tracks of a sizable herd of buffalo. They were probably the reason the Indians had left. With winter coming, buffalo were more important to the warriors than two white men, though probably they meant to return and finish off the whites once the hunt was over. All day he persevered, dragging himself along. He stopped less frequently because he found it hard to get started once he stopped. Rest was seductive, made more so by his tendency to improve the situation through imagination. Maybe the herd had moved north faster than he calculated. Maybe Call would show up the next day and save him the painful business of dragging along with his crutch. Yet he hated waiting almost as much as he hated the traveling. His habit had been to go and meet whatever needed to be met, not to wait idly for what might approach. What was approaching now was death, he knew. He had faced it before and overridden its motion with his own. To sit and wait for it gave it too many advantages. He had seen many men die of wounds and had watched the turning of their spirits from active desire to live to indifference. With a bad wound, the moment indifference took over, life began to subside. Few men rose out of it, most lost all impulse toward activity, and ended by offering death at least a half-hearted welcome. Augustus didn't intend to do that, so he struggled on. When he took his rests, he took them standing up, leaning on the crutch. It took less will to get started if one was standing up. He hobbled over the plain through the long afternoon and twilight, finally collapsing sometime in the night. His hand slipped off the crutch, and he felt it falling from him. In stooping to reach for it, he fell face down, unconscious before he hit the ground. In his dreams, he was with Lorena, in the tent on the hot Kansas plains. He longed for her to cool him somehow, touch him with her cool hand. But though she smiled, she didn't cool him. The world had become red as though the sun had swollen and absorbed it. He felt as if he were lying on the surface of the red sun as it looked at sunset when it sank into the plain. When he got his eyes open, the sun was white, not red, and directly above him. He heard a spitting sound, such as a human would make, and his hand went to the pistol at his belt, thinking the Indians had come. But when he turned his head, it was a white man he saw, a very old, small white man in patched buckskins. The old man had a tobacco-stained beard and a bowie knife in his hand. A spotted horse grazed nearby. 
The old man was just squatting there, watching. Augustus kept his hand on his gun, but didn't draw it. He didn't know if he had the strength to draw it. Them was blood Indians, the old man said. It beats all they didn't get you. You got enough of them. Five is all, Augustus said, raising himself to a sitting position. He didn't like to talk lying down. Seven, I heard, the old man said. I get along with the bloods and the Blackfeet, too. Bought lots of beaver from them in the beaverin' days. I'm Augustus McRae, Augustus said. You auld, the visitor said. Down my old city they called me old Hugh, although I doubt I'm eighty yet. Was you meanin' to stab me with that knife? Augustus asked. I'd rather not shoot you unnecessarily. Old Hugh grinned and spat again. I was about to have a go at cutting off that rotten leg of yours, he said. Before you come to, I was. That leg's ruined, but I might have a hell of a time cutting through the bone without no saw. Besides, you might have woke up and give me trouble. Spect I would have, Augustus said, looking at the leg. It was no longer black-striped, just black. We got to take it off, old Hugh said. If that rot gets in the other leg, you'll lose both of them. Augustus knew the old man was right in everything he said. The leg was rotting, but a boy knife was no instrument for taking it off. How far is Miles City, he asked. I guess they've got a saw bones there. Two, last time I went to town, old Hugh said. Both drunkards. You forgot to inform me of the distance, Augustus said. Forty miles and a fraction, Hugh said. I don't believe you could have walked it. Augustus used the crutch to pull himself up. I might fool you, he said, though it was just pride talking. He knew quite well he couldn't have walked it. Just getting to his feet left him nauseous. Where'd you come from, stranger? The old man asked. He rose to his feet but did not exactly straighten up. His back was bent. To Augustus he seemed scarcely five feet tall. I was setting a deadfall and let it fall on me, old Hugh explained cheerfully. Some blood warriors found me. They thought it was funny, but my back never did straighten out. We all have misfortunes, Augustus said. Could I borrow your horse? Take it. Only don't kick him, old Hugh said. If you kick him, he'll buck. I'll follow along as best I can in case you fall off. He led the spotted horse over and helped Augustus mount. Augustus thought he might pass out, but managed not to. He looked at old Hugh. You sure you get along with these Indians? he asked. I'd be embarrassed if you came to any trouble on my account. I won't, old Hugh said. They're off stuffing themselves with fresh buffalo meat. I was invited to join them, but I think I'll poke along after you, even though I don't know where you come from. A little fart of a town called Lonesome Dove, Augustus said. It's in South Texas on the Rio Grande. Dern, the old man said, clearly impressed by the information. You're a traveling son of a bitch, ain't you? Does this horse have a name? Augustus asked. I might need to speak to him. I've been calling him Custer, old Hugh said. I done a little scouting for the general once. 